Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Global Health Conversation with Dr. Yodi Alakija, brought to you by Stanford Center for Innovation in Global Health and the Center for African Studies. I'm Dr. Michelle Berry, Senior Associate Dean for Global Health at Stanford and Director of the Center for Innovation in Global Health. I'm thrilled to be introducing our guest today, Dr. Yodi Alakija. But before we get to Alakija, I'd like to introduce the fantastic Paul Costello, who will be leading our conversation. For 17 years, Paul has served as the Chief Communications Officer at Stanford Medicine, and then as a Senior Communications Strategist. Today, he serves as our Senior Communications Advisor at the Center for Innovation and Global Health, and is an adjunct lecturer in the Department of Medicine. Paul is a fantastic communicator and a first-class interviewer, and we're very lucky to get some of his time today. And now for our esteemed guest, Dr. Yodi Alakija. Dr. Alakija is the co-chair of the Africa Union um, Vaccine Delivery Alliance for COVID-19, a role she has piloted with tenacity and zeal, using her pulpit to advocate for equitable vaccine distribution across African nations and beyond. She's a highly skilled communicator, using her voice to spread the message of health equity far past the borders of her post. As Nigeria's former chief humanitarian coordinator, she led and coordinated the national and international response to the 2017 Boko Haram insurgency in Northeastern Nigeria. Dr. Alakija has served as a high level negotiator between state and non-state actors at governmental and intergovernmental levels. She has a track record of delivering results with a demonstrated ability to identify and troubleshoot critical and complex issues in the context of countries in conflict and crisis. She's accustomed to dealing with urgent circumstances and is skilled in bringing attention to humanitarian crises. She has borne this burden with grace and thrown her weight behind many essential causes. And last but certainly not least, in her many roles, Dr. Alakisha serves on our Global Advisory Board of Women Lift Health, an organization to catalyze long-term change among individuals, institutionals, and societies to help more women expand their voice and influence as top leaders in global health. This is just one expression of her passion for uplifting women's voices. She is a firm believer that leadership and women's leadership in public health is essential to delivering health outcomes. And she is a force in advocating for women to speak, lead, and be heard. Today, with COVID-19 surging in Africa and across the global South, we are luck lucky to have Yodi with us to shed some light on strategies for equitable vaccine allocation and insights she has gleaned from her very accomplished career. Yodi, thank you for joining us and being such a role model for women. Following our conversation, we have reserved 20 minutes for a Q&A. And Paul, I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you so much, Dr. Barry, Michelle, and uh... Dr. Alakija, thank you for joining us. I'm so honored to talk to you. And we spoke a few weeks ago and, and you said that you allowed me to refer to you as Yodi. So I will from hence on. As of today, there have been 4 million deaths worldwide from the pandemic. Africa marks its worst pandemic week with cases surging and vaccine scarcity. And speaking about the current state of the health crisis, the director general of the WHO said it will not be over anywhere until it is over everywhere. And he also decried what he called vaccine nationalization, which you have called vaccine apartheid. Those are pretty strong words. What are we... Where are we in this moment? What are your greatest fears? And what are you hearing from the ground? Thank you, Paul. And thank you, um, Michelle, for the wonderful introduction. It's great to be here. Um, Dr. Tedros of WHO is absolutely correct when, when he talks about the urgency of this moment that we're in, when he says it's not going to be over anywhere until it's over 
you know, in, in all parts of the world. And you, 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 you describe vaccine apartheid as being strong words, but there are not, no words strong enough for this moment that we're in in our history. This is a one in a hundred year event. It's a one in a hundred year pandemic. As you said, 4 million people dead as of yesterday, people now dying in numbers across Africa, across Latin America. We've seen over 3000% increase in cases in some countries in Africa, in places as far away as Fiji and the South Pacific, which is my other, my other home where cases went from about 10 just a few weeks ago to over 790 just yesterday, um, a rate of increase greater than the rate that, was, that, that we saw in India in those early days. So this is a critical moment in time. It is a critical moment in history. And vaccine apartheid is maybe not even strong enough a term to describe what is going on right now. Because you have countries like you know, the, the UK or the USA and parts of the EU that have vaccinated up to 60%, some, you know, 70% in some states in the United States, in, in, in America, which is a wonderful accomplishment. But because there are not enough doses to go around, other parts of the world are literally dying for want of that jab in the arm, for want of that, that, that vaccine. Um, health workers are dying all over the world. Uh, particularly, Michelle referred to my role with women, in many ways, many places, women are at the forefront of this. Young women, older women are dying. So vaccine apartheid, I would say, is not strong enough. We have to come at this with equity in this moment. You know, you, you spoke about just a moment ago about the lack of resources and health systems throughout the global south are very fragile mm -hmm. in the best of times. So what is nine deaths in Uganda in the past week of healthcare workers, of physicians, mm -hmm. nine medical doctors mm -hmm. have died. Mm -hmm. What do you see? What, what do you hear is unfolding among health workers and the impact of this upon the health system in the global south? It's over. It's more than nine now. It's about twenty, I think, in Uganda, Zambia. The, the last weekend, there was four dead doc, um, medical doctors and nurses who died. And somebody talk, told me that for each one, that's twelve thousand people who now have to go without a healthcare worker because it's not as though there are enough healthcare workers in these countries to start off with. The health systems are fragile. You know, organized institutions such as yours, Stanford, uh, have worked with us. Many, many institutions across the United States, across Europe, have worked to, to help build up that, that um, you know, the, the healthcare system and help work, build up healthcare workers and train them. We can't afford to lose them. But whether they're healthcare workers or whether they're just mom and dad or sister or grandma, these lives matter. These people's lives matter. And what we're hearing on the ground is morgues overflowing, mortuaries overflowing in in places like Zambia, some countries people are being told to bury their, their dead immediately because there is no space in mortuaries. Most importantly, there is no, there, there is no not enough diagnostics, there's not enough oxygen in many of our countries. So people are literally in some parts like South Africa, even South Africa, which is one of the strongest on, on the African continent, people are ordering their, their oxygen cylinders online so that they can keep them at home just in case if they need them, if they get sick. If we had vaccines rolled out, out if we had had a more equitable system as, 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 as this thing began to evolve uh, sort of over the past year, we would not now be where we are in a place where in Europe, we're watching, you know, the, the, the football, the soccer, as you would call it in America, you know, there's the Euro 2020 and there's stadiums full of 60,000 people. It's incredible to see, you know, and, and yet in parts of Africa, people are literally dying at the doorsteps of hospitals or dying in their homes for want of oxygen because they have not been able to be vaccinated against this virus. So the, the inequity is so glaring you know, that, that one cannot use soft language around it. And, and I think that is the whole, the, it's the whole um, thing around change, isn't it? That we have to, we have to go at it boldly. We have to go at it with courage because if we, if we're, we're sort of, you know, going softly, softly, being politically correct about what we say, nothing is going to change. Um, equity is about power. You know, the, the, the vaccine equity is about power. Gender equality is about power. So both of those things for me in this moment collide as I begin to advocate for, for vaccine equity. And I realize that all of my life I've been advocating for gender equality. And it's all about an imbalance of power. In this moment, an imbalance of power that, 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 that favors the global north versus the global south in terms of access to di diagnostics, you know, therapeutics, medicines, and vaccines. 
I guess, you know, one of the things that struck me last week or this week was there was a tweet by you. There was a setup. A zoo announced that animals, including mountain lions, tigers, and bears, were administered the COVID vaccine. And the zoo said that primates will be next in line to receive the vaccine. You tweeted, no comment. Now, I'm sure underneath that no comment, there is outrage and disgust because of you just talked about that pinpoints the glaring inequity across the globe. Absolutely. I mean, and for me, it was it was a no comment because I, I saw this thing and I thought, wow, <laughs> you know, zoos in San Francisco and zoos in other parts of America are vaccinating the lions and the, the tigers and the, 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 the you know, the, the boons and the primates before we in Africa get vaccines, get access to those same vaccines. I mean, the irony is just it's it's it, there is literally no comment to that. And that is what I mean about power. And don't get me wrong. I mean, I, my, I love animals. I, my pets, I talk, I have one daughter and I tell everybody my youngest child is a Rhodesian Ridgeback dog. Um, so it's not that I'm not, I don't want us to care for animals. I absolutely adore my pets and my cat, and, but people are dying, you know? So if we can afford to provide vaccines for zoo animals, but we're not prepared to do what it takes to get vaccines into human arms, be it in Africa or in Asia or, 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 or in Latin America and other parts of the world, surely there is something wrong with that. There is something wrong with a system that allows entire continents to be protected against the disease and then begin to shut others out as is beginning to happen with these red lists and these travel bans, you know, to say that it's a it's a haves and a have nots. It's a them and us situation. You know, they they are over there. They don't have vaccines. They have the COVID. But we over here, we have had our, our vaccines. And so we're COVID free. And so we can have a live a normal life. And it's not just life and death. It's not binary poor. There's also long COVID. So for those who say, well, it's not affecting younger people and maybe the populations in some of the African countries or Asian or Latin American countries are younger, there's also the specter of long COVID. There's a specter of the, we don't know yet what, what effects this disease is going to have on healthcare systems going forward. So it is really, it is so much more complex than, you know, well, they're not dying in quite the numbers that we thought they might die in, so let's leave them um, so that we can get on and, and enjoy our lives. Inequity is inequity. And, and it, 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 it is a basic human right. People will say to you that, well, you know, the vaccines were paid for by rich countries, but it is a global good. It is a global good and not the, the, the vaccine, the, 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 the scientists who, who made up those wonderful teams, incredible people. You know, I was talking yesterday about Professor Sarah Gilbert from Oxford University and some of the incredible women who have contributed to, these, to this effort. You know, they all come from a multitude of countries of, around the world. But what we seem to have going on here is a birthplace lottery or, 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 or a where you live lottery in life. So, you know, we have a global pandemic. If you were born in the rich, you know, high income countries of the world, you have a higher chance of life than if you were born in Africa or say Latin America or Asia. COVAX was supposed to be the great answer to this, to equity, to fairness, to access. What happened? You've been a significant critic of COVAX. What do you see? What's your current criticism of them today? And what's not happening that needs to happen? I, I, I wouldn't say that, I, I mean, Critic, criticism, but critique, not criticism. Critique. Go critique. Back. Kovacs as a mechanism, as an idea, was wonderful in its in, in, in thought, you know. Let us help support those who have no access to vaccines. Let us provide vaccines for those who have none. My main critique of Kovacs, and I think some incredible people, I've literally just come out of a meeting where I've just been thanking um, people from Gavi and Kovacs for, for the work that they've all been doing and the fact that vaccines are now beginning through the sharing mechanism, largely due to President Biden in the United States, is beginning to come to Africa in the next week or so, but it was non-inclusive. It goes back to this issue of power that I spoke to earlier, um, Paul. It goes back to this issue of equity and of voice. You know, COVAX was fantastic in its, in its, in its whole concept, but it was, for me, it was flawed in its implementation because there wasn't enough there wasn't enough inclus inclusivity of the African voice or maybe the, the, the Asian voice or the Latin American voice to say, what do you need? The low middle income countries of the world. COVAX said, we will provide you 
with vaccines, with 20% of vaccines for your population, with an assumption that, you know, most countries will only maybe need about 20%, because that's what most countries thought, and there wasn't a discussion around it. Today, I would say that COVAX are really trying to right those wrongs, and I really, you know, I give them huge credit for that, and I think that they have, they need, I mean, COVAX is some parts of Africa, yes, we can afford to buy vaccines in, say, Nigeria and other countries and, 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 and have the geopolitical power, because this is also a geopolitical um, sort of, it's a geopolitical morass that we're in. It's not just about health. And that is the other part of the, the, the argument that I have going on going forward is that this has been treated just as a health problem. COVAX and others, Gabby and others saw it as a health issue. They did not recognize at the time just how much politics and this neoliberalism going into nationalism, it was going to play in to this pandemic. So COVAX, I think, are really now trying to listen. I've had the opportunity to to, to, to work with, with the ACT Accelerator on a couple of occasions and really impressed by the fact that they're now saying, look, we want to, what do you need? How do we support you? And we're not leading from the front. We are supporting you from behind and allowing you to have the voice to, to, to say what it is you need and how you need it. What you're really saying also is that colonialization is still very much alive, very much a part of the way in which the world deals with the global South. Absolutely. I mean, you know, that's why I said power and, 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 and the way that the global health infrastructure was designed post World War Two in a way that that was it was, you know, the, the, the wealthier global north sort of having a charity arm. It was more a charity perspective as opposed to a partnership perspective. And what the world is asking for in this moment is the world has changed. You know, again, we talk about vaccines. We talk about we talk about gender. You know, we, the world in, in the 60s, we were fighting for, 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 for gender equality and for, for, for control over our bodies. In the 40s and 50s around the world, people were fighting for, for, for racial equality and, and for control over, over their right to vote or their right to marry the person they want to marry you know these things are so intertwined and i think from the global health world which we both belong to all three of us michelle included i think we have not had quite had that shift we haven't quite understood that things have moved on from where we were africa in many ways it has been the playing ground where the, the world has continued to give the odd sock to to, to, to do the charity as opposed to the partnership. And yet some of the most capable people around the world who are not maybe physically present within Africa, but are working for multilateral institutions, Dr. Tedros and others around the world, they are Africans. What is the difference? Why are they seen differently when they're outside of Africa from how they're seen when they're within Africa? It is that neo-colonial outlook. It is that we have to, we have to tell them what they need to do. Not what I think, you know, I'm saying in this moment and have been saying, and I speak as an individual, I don't speak as a, and I'm not speaking for the entire continent, but what I'm saying in this moment is that that needs to change. You know, that needs to change. It is time for Africa to sit up and be mistress of her own destiny. It is time for Africa to, to, to be recognized, to look eye, in, eye to eye with the global powers and be recognized as as a, as a force. And it is for us to do that work. We have to do the work, not just in the global health field, it has to be done on a political level as well. So it's a, it's, it's a multifaceted and it's a complex issue, but this pandemic has shone a light on everything that was fractured and broken in society. It has sort of put a magnifying glass on it. And there is an opportunity in this crisis for us to see true change whilst, you know, literally fighting hand, hand, hand you know, whatever whatever way you want to say for vaccines so that people will live today we have to also grab the opportunity at the same time for tomorrow to ensure that those who are coming behind us do not have to fight the battles that we're fighting today for me that is a critical part of this of, of this time that we're in you mentioned the magnifying glass and i guess the magnifying glass is also showing that there is an increase in gender-based violence during the pandemic. Can you talk more about what is happening? Why has the pandemic stirred this violence and how is it impacting girls across the global South? Oh, that is really, 
it's not only it's not just gender based violence poor it's um girls schooling you know when we had the first lockdowns across africa across many parts of the world some of the girls who went home during those first lockdowns never went back to school even when school came back there's been an increase in child marriage F female genital mutilation is back up again um girls are being traded because it's socioeconomics across many countries, people are, are, are really struggling. So people are, are, are again marrying their daughters off for, for dowries because they can't afford to feed them. There's violence, domestic violence in, in homes because of the frustration of being, you know, there are people being locked down in quarters that 14, 15 people are living in. And the impact on women, not just, you know, I, I spoke earlier about healthcare workers and nurses and doctors and, and women across Africa, carers, primary carers, but the impact on girls, the impact on girls' education, the impact on girls' reproductive health, because many services were closed. So where some young women were able to access reproductive health services in confidentiality, they're now no longer to do, able to do that. Teen pregnancy has gone sky, has skyrocketed all over the world. And that comes with a concomitant increase in, in, in as you said, violence, in, in femicide, women are being killed. I mean, the impact of this pandemic on women, not just women's health, not just women's education, but just who we are as women, you know? And yet you look at the leadership of the pandemic around the world, you look at who is, who is, who is doing best from a political perspective, woman, um, Jacinda Ardern, but who is leading the sort of the, the, the task forces and who is leading the drive against COVID? There are very few women at that table. And again, we see that this is why we have to have voice and we have to speak out um, and, and, and speak out boldly. People don't necessarily like what we have to say, but if we don't say it, tomorrow will never change. And my Danielle, my daughter, or my Simi, my, my goddaughter, and others around them will, will never be able to realize their full potential because, you know, another crisis will come and they will have to be married off because I didn't speak or Michelle didn't speak. This is what that fight for me for gender equality is all about. That those of us, you know, it's, it's a disruptive moment for me. You know, and some will say, oh, well, you know, that's, that's, that's almost confrontational. No, it's a dis we, need to, we need to recognize the moment that we're in for, for the entire world, that we have a chance in this moment to disrupt, to bring true, true, um, oh, what's the word? True focus onto the issues that affect women. That even within a pandemic, let me ask you, you know, when, when people, when you look at the, the lines in, in, countries where people are, especially low middle income countries, where people are going to get their vaccines, typically they're mainly men. And I said this the other day as we were discussing vaccine delivery across Africa, why? Because the women have to be at home looking after the babies. The women are in the, in the farm farming. The women have to keep doing what they're doing whilst the man is presumed to be the one who can go, who, who if he wants to will go forward and get a vaccine. So even then we're disadvantaged and yet we're not we're not there yet in terms of leadership and being able to bring this lens to the fact that we need women at the forefront of COVID, the, the, the fight against COVID, not just vaccines. You talked about yourself as a disruptor. And also, I, I, I want to lead into that by saying women standing on the table. And you <laughs> literally stood on the table. Can you talk about that moment in time and, and why you felt the need to make such a significant and strong statement? <laughs> well, this is becoming, it's sort of, it's becoming my, my, my signature, isn't it? The standing on the table. And in fact, I, I received a, a, a birthday gift lot just last week of a lovely leather book and grades get on the table. So it's definitely a thing. Um, we talk about a seat at the table and people say, well, if they don't give you a seat at the table, pull up a chair. But oftentimes you pull up a chair at the table and people still don't listen. Nobody's paying attention. It's sometimes it's tokenistic. Even sometimes they'll give you a seat at the table, but it's tokenistic. They're like, be, sit down, be there and just be, be quiet. You know, we want the photos to show that you're at the table, metaphorically speaking, but we don't necessarily want to hear your voice. I deal with this every day. I'm dealing with it right now at the moment in some instances, believe it or not. You know, we don't necessarily want to hear your voice. Just, you know, we just, just be there. 
But when you get on a table, you know, what I did at that conference, and it was in Rwanda, it was the women, um, in, in, women Leaders in Global Health, the second annual conference in Rwanda in 2019, it was a meeting, it, it, was a, it, was a, it, was a, it was a breakfast and talking about mentorship. And there were lots of young women in the room who had asked me, well, how do we make a difference? How do we allow get ourselves heard? And it was interestingly enough, it was a session for women. And the first people who came into the room largely were men, which is great, we want male allies. But the people sort of around the front of the room were also men. And I looked at this room and I thought, this is really interesting, this dynamic. So I invited, they sat around a table and I sort of went around and asked them if I could just excuse me, excuse me. And I climbed on the table, I got on top of the table <laughs> and they all stopped what they were doing. They looked up at me and I had their attention. And that's what getting on that table is about because I had their attention in that moment. I wasn't just sitting there. I was on the table and they realized that they needed to listen. What is it she wants? What is it, what is it that is needed in this moment? She is there. We have to pay attention. And, and, and that is why I felt the need to do that. And I cannot tell you hundreds of women in, in global health. And when I, I don't say, when I say young women, I mean they're women in their 30s and their 40s. Some of my peers have come up to me afterwards and said that moment shifted something for them. It shifted, it made them realize, realize that we, we, we have to, power isn't given, it is taken. And we have to make our voices heard if we're going to change things for the generations to come. You know, in the, in the moments that you were considering that, standing on the table, making a significant and broad and big move. What were you thinking about? What were you, what were you saying were you, to yourself as you did that, as you thought of, I need to do something significant. I need to disrupt. I wasn't actually even thinking I needed to do huh. something significant. I literally, it was in the moment. It was, I looked around the room and I was leading this session. I looked around the room and I saw the table, I saw the men, and I thought, just get on the table, because that is how you're going to demonstrate. There are no words that can describe or you can mentor people into, you know, how do you get yourself heard? But that action showed them that sometimes you need to disrupt. Sometimes, and it's, it's you don't disrupt just for disruption's sake. You know, you, you, you disrupt to those people who have made the biggest difference, I think, in this world have been, some of them have been disruptors. Look at Nelson Mandela, you know, just, uh, just before he died, someone like Nelson Mandela was considered, he was considered a terrorist in some countries. Why? Because he fought against the status quo. Those who don't want, who hold power, who don't want the status quo to change, often will consider those who, who, are, who are pushing against it um, disruptors or agitators. But by the end of his life, when society had caught up with him, what he was wasn't just a disruptor, he was a visionary. He was a visionary. He could see the world as it should be. And he had the courage and he had the, 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 the sense of self-sacrifice to say, you know what? I don't have to be the one. And if I have to lay myself down, which he did for 27 years, if I have to lay myself down to make this point so that others coming behind me will not have to suffer what I and those, 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 those others have had to suffer, then I will do that. And that is the way I think. I think for me, it's, it's like when you, those people who go to war, you know, when you watch those old films and people hand-to-hand -hand combat, you know, the sort of ancient movies where they're sort of, slicing and dicing the infantry the ones who go before oftentimes they, they they're not the ones who, who who taste the sweet victory they often die they're often they they, they 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 take out the first the first line of resistance and then the others fight on and climb on their backs stand literally on their shoulders and can achieve victory mm. And I think there need to be more of us who are women, who are disruptors, who are leaders in global health or in, in gender or what have you, who have to be prepared to say, you know what, they're not going to like what I say, but I don't really, I'm not concerned about that. I'm not looking for, for change for myself in my lifetime necessarily because it might not happen, but I want it to change for Danielle. I want it to change for my daughter. I want it to change for those who are coming behind me. So I'm prepared to be that first charge and to charge hard knowing that they can then stand on my shoulders. Talking about change, you talked earlier, you, you mentioned earlier that this is a moment in which global health 
architecture needs to shift. This is a moment in which the system that was built after the Second World War needs a new face. What is that shift and, and what are the ingredients that you think are important in that shift? Inclusion of all parties. And when I say inclusion, I don't mean, I mean on the table type inclusion. Mm -hmm. I mean, equal voice. You know, for instance, I had a conversation just yesterday or day before about, you just asked about COVAX and, and Gavi and, and things like that. And I said, but it's, we, it's really strange to me how you have a, a, a institution that like, you know, some of these institutions, let me not mention any particularly, that are serving African people or African populations who are maybe 25% of their market. And yet there isn't a specific place on the board specifically for leadership from that continent. Um, so that sort of deliberate, I think we need to be purposeful and deliberate about our thinking. And I think that has been done in some countries, um, you know, the, the United Nations, I have to say, have done a great job in a way of being deliberate about having 50% of women in some leadership positions. So I think for global health, it is now time to think of saying, well, perhaps we have, if we're serving people with vaccines in Africa, and it is Gavi or whoever it is, or Sepi or whoever it is who's in charge of that, let us make sure that we have you know, key leadership positions in those organizations occupied by, say, the director of Africa CDC, for instance, um, so that that voice is, is, is there and that it is inclusive in its design going forward. I think the other key point would be that we need less charity and more partnership. I, I've said that before, but partnership means talking to me as an equal and accepting what I have to say, as opposed to telling me what you think I need and, 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 and expecting me to be grateful because you have granted me an opportunity to speak. Um, I think also, and I, I, I said this in a talk the other day about global health, one of the things, and this is a, a, a university, so I, I'm actually really happy to, to repeat this, that global health, teaching, how we teach global health, how we approach global health needs to change. That we need to understand that there is geopolitics involved. We need to understand that there's diplomacy involved. We need to understand that there is e economics involved. You know, and I think, for instance, with COVID, we have seen it so much as a health issue that too many people missed the other things that were going on in the background. And those are the things for me, as the global health infrastructure goes forward, that we begin to embrace the more holistic nature of health, the very definition of health, state of you know, physical, social, mental well-being. But we, we embrace it all as, as this new world that we're in, this new sort of interconnected, digitally connected world where somebody can sneeze in Washington, D.C., and it affects what's going on in Johannesburg. When you look down the road at the potential impact on economic growth and in the ability of African nations to bounce back from the pandemic, what do you see? How significant a damage do you think this is? And what do you see for the future after we move past the pandemic? Uh, well, first of all, when are we going to move past the pandemic? If we don't get vaccines, this pandemic is going to keep going round and round. And you know, Delta, I heard yesterday, I, I think I opened a couple of days ago my, my, my sort of social media and saw the Lambda variant and I literally just turned my phone off. I thought, you know what, I just can't even, I just can't, I don't want to know because this is, it's, it's, and this is caused by the fact that we haven't vaccinated the whole world quickly enough. So the first point is how do we end the pandemic? What we're being told by, by um, the, the World Bank is that for every month delay in vaccination in Africa, we are losing $13.8 billion in GDP. That was before we got into this really awful wave where, you know, this current third wave of the, the, the pandemic where, you know, countries like Uganda have gone into a 42 day shutdown. I mean, these are economies where people live day to day, you know, Zambia, um, U Uganda, Zimbabwe, all of these countries, economic activity has ground to a near halt. Almost 20, I think about 30 countries in Africa are shut off from travel from the, from the rest of the world because of the variants. So the long-term economic damage is to my mind incalculable. And we can't begin to calculate it until we know when we can vaccinate our people. You know, you, you so go ahead. 
I'm talking about the damage. I, I want to get into this before we uh, take questions. When we spoke several weeks ago, you talked about mm -hmm. leadership and the lack of leadership by President Trump and his administration on the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And you made a searing indictment. And the indictment was that if the U.S. is saying there isn't a problem, the world says it isn't a problem. What was the ripple effect of that intransigence during the administration? And, and how dramatically do you think that would have changed had there been leadership like we have today, globally? <laughs> Incalculable. I said that to you at the beginning. I'm not afraid to say this. There are those who will say this is a political discussion. No, this is life and humanity. Had at the beginning of 2020, when the first alarms went off, about this virus, had there been global leadership, and it's not just leadership in the United States, I mean, leadership generally, but typically the US people have looked to the United States as a global leader in, in this area. You know, when Ebola broke out, I remember how the then, I think Obama administration, I remember the incredible things, partnerships that were done, you know, in, in that came into play with OFDA and others in parts of Africa to shut that down and so that it didn't turn into what this has turned into. If similar things had been done with Ebola that were done last year under the previous administration in the US, Ebola would have taken over the world. So when you say how how bad was, I mean, to my mind, had the, the United States government at the time, and I don't, whoever it was, I don't want to name, name names, the United States government at the time, had they taken this seriously, it would have shortened this pandemic by at least a year maybe a year and a half, because the United States government and, 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 and all of the expertise and the, the power that the US has had within the global um, you know, multilateral environment, et cetera. I mean, there was, they shut off funding to WHO, for goodness sake, in the middle of a pandemic. If the US had taken it seriously, if the US had recognized the risk and the threat that this was to global peace and security, because that is what it is, then the pandemic, to my mind, would have been over pretty much by now, because there would have been, if had, was I leading the world at the time, I would have had a coordinated shutdown of borders, you know, for six to eight weeks in the immediate instance, all countries, that takes global leadership, that takes power. And what is powerful? Power is so that you can affect change in others' lives or affect change in nations. Power is not just so that you can, you know, have good parties and wear nice suits and make pretty speeches. Power is for change. And that is what should have been done last year. The whole world looked to America for power and bad behavior begets bad behavior. So you had what happened with Bolsonaro and people like that in Brazil. You had what happened in, in India. You know, the populist leaders of the world thought, oh, well, if the US isn't taking this seriously, well then surely they have the scientists. It really can't be that bad. So let's relax. And now we have 4 million people people dead later, it is an indictment on, 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 on so many individuals that this happened. It did not have to be like this. And um, it, it, it's, it's heartbreaking to me that at the time, the leadership, global leadership wasn't there to do what was needed in the moment. You were, you were not really jubilant after the G7 met. I mean, you were sort of very skeptical and very cautious, and that has been borne out. Yeah, um, I mean, look, the G7, so, I mean, leading up to the G7, I had the privilege of being a part of the, the expert panel, panel of experts or whatever you call them, to, who advised the um, G20. And, and then we, we tried to come out with a strong statement. I mean, there, there's been independent panels, um, the IPPPR um, panel of experts who evaluated the pandemic, who have called for an independent evaluation, for instance, of COVAX, to, to, to go back to that. But after G7, I was disappointed. I was really excited when President Biden boarded that plane um, when he boarded Air Force One and made the announcement just as he took off, I thought it was beautifully orchestrated, 500 million doses. And what he did was lay down a gauntlet for the rest of the G7. It was like, come on, guys, come on, let's do this. You know, the world needs 11 billion doses, not just 1 billion, not just 2 billion, 11 billion doses. So he laid down the gauntlet with the 500 million and it was a generous, I mean, it wasn't just leftovers. And that is what I talk about when I say partnership. You know, the, the, the Biden administration's offer was to purchase Pfizer vaccines for 
500 million, to the tune of 500 million doses. I expected the rest of the G7 to layer on that. And we came out of the entire meeting with 870 million doses. I mean, que pasa? For, till next year, and, and most of them not coming till next year. The vaccines are needed now, not next month, not in six months time. The vaccines, actually the vaccines were le needed two months ago because now with what we're seeing with the surge in Africa specifically, it's too late to vaccinate as at the same, or you sh it's not ideal to be vaccinating at the same time as you have a massive, massive humanitarian health crisis because the health workers are completely overworked and they're trying to deal with really sick people. So I was disappointed. Um, I, was, I, was, I was pleased by the US announcement. I was disappointed by, by the rest. It was, it was a lot of talk and no action. Yoni, thank you. We're gonna close this part of the uh, conversation and we're now gonna take questions from our participants, our audience. One question, is there the manufacturing capacity in Africa that can be tapped to produce vaccines? What are, you, are your views on IP sharing and the TRIPS? I, you know, the, and the TRIPS agreement. I know one thing you said recently was that you can't reproduce Delilah's recipes, so you don't <laughs> give much faith in reproducing vaccines. Is that sort of correct analysis? Oh, well, you have really studied, you've done your homework. That's very good. So in an article in an op-ed that I wrote, I this Delia Smith is a is a well-known British, um, you know cook cook person she's a recipe she has great recipes and the issue the, the point i was making there is that I, you can give me the recipe you can give me you know but if you don't teach me how to do it if you don't do the point by point teach and that is you know in terms of the the waiver yes you can give the waiver you can give the recipe but there needs also to be the transfer of technology and so it's not just the trip mate waiver so to answer the question very quickly the the is there manufacturing capacity? There is some manufacturing capacity. Institute Pasteur in Senegal have just have announced recently they're going to be able to produce 300 million COVID vaccines, mRNA, I think, COVID vaccines by next year. Aspen in, um, um, Institute in South Africa are currently producing many of the Johnson & Johnson vaccines. I, I think that they're actually, I don't know whether they're coming to the US, but they're definitely going to Europe and they're also being exported around Africa. So there is manufacturing capacity. Yes, it needs to be scaled up, but we need to remove the hurdles that are in the way. And that is what some of those trips, et cetera, are. So yes, I do agree that they should be removed, but I, but I also am very, I'm a realist and I'm a pragmatist, and I recognize that there needs to be more than just a removal of a waiver. So the question is, early on, decolonization activists condemned people that attributed low COVID rates in low income countries to incidental circumstance. Now that the Delta variant is undoing these good efforts in many low income countries, how do we continue to celebrate those early public health victories and recognize them for future learnings? That's an interesting one. Um, yes, th there's, there's several things going on there. I think and, and I think it's almost been a catch-22 in that because we seem to have done so well in some of the low middle income countries of the world with COVID in the early days seemed to, um, being the, the, the operative phrase, people thought, well, that Africa or you know, Asia is not affected and therefore let's not pay much attention. How well did Africa, how well did the low middle income countries of the world do? in reality, because there was very little diagnostics, there was very little testing. And the, the, the issue was that, so yes, we did, we had disease control measures that were immediately put in place, but also the world shut down. And we don't have that much traffic between all of our countries and, 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 and the, the, the rest of the world. If you look at sort of flight maps of flights going in, in terms of infection rates. So I think we were protected, we were, we were lucky, and also we were smart in our immediate movements. And I mean, those using those lessons learned, I think those are there for us because we deal with epidemics all the time. You know, in terms of what the Delta variant has now done, my real concern with that question and the, the sentiment behind it is that there's a sense that there's a sense of exceptionalism there that, oh, well, we've done so well in the past, which is what India had and what befell India. And I think it's a bit early to, 
to make that call in this pandemic who still don't fully understand what's going on. So I, I said before, and if you've read some of my, my writings and interviews, you would know that I've said that there, I felt two months ago that there was a hidden pandemic in Africa. I've said it, I've said it over and over again that I felt it was a hidden pandemic. I felt that we weren't picking up cases. There's not, you know, India was visceral. India was visceral because the, 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 the sheer sight of those funeral pyres burning across the country that so you could literally see from outer space was, was, it, it was it was such a picture of burning, the virus burning its way across the world. And just yesterday I was talking to somebody and I said, for me, the Africa scenario is really sad because it feels like their bodies silence, silently slipping underwater, crying out for help, a silent, mass drowning that nobody can see. So we need to be careful to declare victory over COVID in, in whatever phase without the right tools at hand. The world has the tools, but we don't have them um, in, in sufficient quantity on the continent. How is the conventional thought about the relationships, the conventional thought, I, I think this is colonialization between providers, patients, and systems in the global South shifting. As, as we move, to, I, I presume it's decolonization, a movement's broad decolonization. What is the shift that you see taking place? Well, is you see, so that's shift? interesting. It's interesting that it says providers, because to me, I wouldn't consider people who are coming from outside to be the providers. I think decolonization mm. is a very broad, grand term, and it speaks again to that power dynamic that I've spoken to earlier. There is a real need, for me, I would say moving away from charity to partnership. Yes, that we call it now decolonization to a certain extent but you know there, there, there's very much the 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 we have come to save you syndrome that that goes on with a lot of the the international groups who come to work in Africa they come to you know you somebody will come to Africa for a two-week seminar on I don't know a, a cardiac health or something and they'll come back to America and they'll be hailed as an Africa expert and yet the person who has been in Africa for 15 years working on the same thing who th this person from America came and attached themselves to for two weeks is not recognized by the same institutions be it you know academic or, or, or medical institutions as an expert so how is the relationship changing between us and those who come to help us I think as the world shifts to, to recognize, and this is what I'm saying about the opportunity in this moment, I think as the world shifts to recognize it, and also the other thing that COVID has done is with Zoom, you can bring more African experts into the room. You can bring, because previously you couldn't get a visa to come to America perhaps, or to go to England, to go to a meeting. So the voices were not being heard. We were not being able to demonstrate what we're able to do. So definitely it's shifting, if that's the question. It's not shifting fast enough, but I think it's also the, the, the language and the messaging around it um, from, from those who work in this field needs to begin to shift. Well, basically, it, that is is enforced by what you said about COVAX vaccines that have been donated, is that they must understand, COVAX must understand that the responsibility ends when the vaccines arrive in country. Absolutely. Well, and so this is why I've said the COVAX and, and, and all of these partners are learning, because just today I just came out of a meeting where they're now talking. So, you know, the banging, my, I, I felt for the longest time like I was banging my head against a brick wall <laughs> and <laughs> shouting into an echo chamber. But clearly people are now listening because they just announced, you know, that they're going to provide, I think, facility of up to $860 million across the entire world, not just Africa, for people to roll out vaccines, which is brilliant because people, you know, there was a situation in South Sudan. I would get on interviews and people would say to me, oh, Dr. Alakaja, South Sudan has not vaccinated their people and they're burning vaccines because they've expired. Did anybody tell you that South Sudan only has one vaccination point in the entire country? Did, I mean, th there was no... There, there was no preparation for rolling out those vaccines. They weren't prepared. They were. They, they had very little notice, and and so the vaccines were, were were being rolled out in one. Imagine in in the whole of Palo Alto or San Francisco, if there was one vaccination point, how would you get how would you get vaccinated? 
So these are some, some of the on the ground realities that only we who are on the ground can understand the hurdles to, to, to vaccinations, but it, 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 it speaks to all aspects of, of global health. It is a local perspective that can bring true change, not an inside, in, you know, outside in helicopter perspective. Here's a question that goes to the what you're just speaking about, the on the ground efforts, the delivery of vaccines to the airport, and then the freezers of countries in need is only the beginning. And the logistics mm -hmm. of actual mm -hmm. vaccination are challenging and vary tremendously in rural versus urban environments. And we need much more attention in training community health workers yes. for efficient mass injection. What steps are must now start to optimize the final steps to inject vaccines in arms? Well, this has been our dilemma because if you don't know when vaccines are coming, if there's no, you have no sight of vaccine, there's no supply line, how do you plan for the vaccination? How do you plan to put jabs in arms? You can't, you, 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 that, that question to me speaks immediately to my heart, which is of setting up huge vaccination centers, you know, using existing structures. There's no need to build new structures, use stadiums, use sports halls, use whatever you can to get vaccines into people's arms as urgently as possible. But then the issue has been with supply and also the information leading to the supply. So because there's been such a global scarcity, because we don't know when vaccines will come, it's been very difficult to make those plans because you, what do you do? You know, you got a vaccine appointment probably by getting online, but you knew there were vaccines there to go to. Do you have people log on or do you have people come and wait for, for weeks in advance and then you send them home again? It then begins to feed into vaccine confidence. And it's another thing that I'm very passionate about because people have said, oh, Africans are hesitant about taking vaccines. And I say, no, you, I don't think you can say that. I mean, I'm sure there's hesitancy everywhere but there is no vaccine confidence without vaccine equity you cannot have vaccine confidence in a place where i don't know whether I, I can get a vaccine tomorrow can my family get a vaccine if it's just a little elite group of people getting vaccines it speaks to there's a suspicion around it i mean in canada i was reading the other day people are literally fighting in pharmacies over whether they get pfizer or moderna vaccine because they prefer mm -hmm. one over the other that is a place mm -hmm. where there's vaccine surplus and equity and therefore they have choice and it speaks to choice in the matter so yes we want to have mass vaccinations and and the logistics of the rollout but first we need to have confidence that when you line up 200,000 people say in Nigeria for a vaccination campaign over a three-day period that you're actually going to have 200,000 vaccines to put in their arms. What gives you hope? What gives you optimism that we'll get through? Or, or are you optimistic that we'll get through this, um, that we will, that Africa will not be remembered as the continent of COVID, that we will move forward, that we will have equity, that we will have vaccinations on mass scale. What gives you hope? Do you have hope? Um, some days. <laughs> <laughs> Some mm. days when, like today, actually, you know, today I chaired a meeting today that gave me some hope because the the vaccine donations from the U.S. government, you know, we hear that some have they're beginning to to it's beginning to become a reality. Um, so that begins to give me hope. Uh, the, 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 what keeps me up at night might be the better question, and that is these variants. Because if we don't vaccinate as quickly as possible, the variants will come back and haunt us. So that gives me that gives me great concern and great pause. Um, the hope comes from all of the multitude of people around the world who are cheering us on and cheering on for those who have nothing, who are saying we're behind you. We will we will help amplify that voice. There's the media have been incredible, I think, in the vaccine equity um, battle over the last few, few, few months because they've kept it on the front burner. They've kept reminding the world, you know, so what gives me hope is that people care and that people recognize the humanity of this moment that we're in, that it is not about the nationalistic self, you know, it, it, it is about our common humanity. 
So that gives me hope. It, 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 the, 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 I get, you know, we're all on Zoom, but some of the people I speak to when, on the days when I want to drop my head on, on the table who literally give you an air hug and say, don't worry, I'm going to go have a meeting with X, Y, Z, you know, at the highest level of whichever government to ensure that we can get what is needed to Africa or to whatever other part of the world I'm advocating for. Some days it's Fiji, you know, getting vaccines to Fiji. And that humanity gives me hope. You know, Michelle, you, people who want, who care and want to want to engage, that keeps hope alive. What does toilet paper have to do with vaccines? <laughs> Paul, oh, so my daughter, I was, I did an interview one day and I was preparing for an interview or something and I was getting really, you know, just really cross about the fact that people were hoarding these vaccines and trying to find an analogy. And she said, mommy, she says, it's like toilet paper. She says, do you remember the beginning of the pandemic where everybody was rushing into supermarkets and buying up all the toilet paper? She said, well, that's the analogy. She said, people are buying up all the, and, and this is it. So that's what toilet paper has to do with vaccines. People think that when we're asking for vaccine equity, we're asking for charity. We're saying, give me a free vaccine um, and, and, and I don't want to pay for it. But the analogy is when you go to the supermarket, you buy up all the toilet paper, there are people waiting in line outside. There are people queuing outside who are trying to get in who want to buy the same toilet paper. But you've bought it all and you've left the store and you haven't left any on the shelves. You know, and I'm not saying I want to wait outside for you to come and hand me for the, the, what you bought. I'm saying just allow me to get my foot in the door and leave some on the shelf so that I can buy some. Canada has bought 10 times the number of vaccines per population. The UK, I think five times, the US five times per for their population. You could vaccinate the whole of Canada 10 times over with the vaccines that Canadian government has. You could vaccinate the whole of America five times over. And yet Africa has vaccinated less than one point something, 1% fully of her population. It's wrong. And that's a toilet paper analogy. You've grabbed all the toilet paper and we want to get in the door to buy some, but we can't. And yet we're being told off because it, 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 the impression that people have is we're waiting outside so that you can throw some at us like the, like, like the kitchen roll analogy from Puerto Rico, I remember a few years ago. That is not what we're, trying, we're, we're, up, we're about. We want equity of voice and we want equity in, 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 in distribution so that we can all be safe around the world. Yodi, thank you so much. It's been a great honor to talk to you today. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. I would like to thank both of you. Um, and Yodi, particularly, I'd like to thank you for being such a powerful voice for gender equity, um, particularly for women in global health, and also for a voice against vaccine apartheid. And thank you, Paul, as always, for a fabulous interview. Bye. <laughs>